second start yes. of second half hour great off is two ten second of July. So the previous group of meerkats in the Kalahari. So there are a number of different burrow systems. And originally they were watching one particular burrow system where they knew that the alpha female had had pups. And what actually happened is a honey badger and the honey badger's own pup went down that system one day and just killed all those pups. So sometimes there are animals that will kill for the sake of killing. Um, not for the sake of eating. Male lions, male lions do it a lot. So what male lions do is they will come into an area and they will kill the lion cubs. That aren't their own. That aren't their own. Because by killing the cubs, what they're doing is they're bringing the females. The females will be ready to reproduce if they don't have cubs. But if a female lion has cubs and she's busy feeding those cubs, she's not ready to reproduce until those cubs leave. And so if the male lion comes in and kills all the cubs, and he won't kill his own cubs, then the females will immediately be ready to mate. And then he'll mate with the female and it'll be his cubs. So he's passing on his genes. So definitely some strange behaviors. Um, yeah. So not not that pleasant. Yes. I know that um, jackals do that too on um, like sheep farms especially. That's why the farmers actually go and shoot them because they'll they won't just like kill one sheep. They'll literally go and wipe out like twenty in a night. Yeah. Yeah. Kaylin. Um, in lion brides, I remember watching one of the lessons when you talked about genetic weaknesses due to insects. In a lion pride. They chase out the male, but the females yes. do stay. Would there be a genetic weakness in there? Because the fathers would mate with the daughters. No, the fathers wouldn't mate with their daughters. No, no. By that time, those daughters are ready to mate. Those fathers will have lost their superior position in the pride. Now, can human influence make animals more? Likely to murder others. So, like, I would if, say so. If, if a predator be in capture, like in captivity, and then released, and then would it possibly be likely for that animal to just go out and just kill everyone? <laughs> I don't think so. I think that they would be possibly no, less so likely. Yeah. But the fact that humans put yeah. fences around areas and concentrate, that definitely changes the behaviour of organisms. But if the animal was abused? I beg your pardon? If the animal was yes. abused in captivity? Yes, it might. Um, yeah, it might very well. Okay, let's go, let's go. Okay, so if the characteristics that make the individual fitter are heritable, then more individuals in the following generation are likely to then inherit the traits than won't. Because these organisms live for longer, and they're healthier, and they're stronger, and they have more opportunities to mate with the females, therefore more individuals in the following generation will inherit those genes than won't. So more individuals, fewer, sorry for you, no bobbies. Okay, all right, does that make sense, guys? And so this is what is meant by survival of the fittest. Okay, so this is evolution by natural selection. If there were genetic traits that helped the individuals to actually survive and they came about by mutations and they are heritable, then that is natural selection. Yes, Josh. So, so uh, just to summarize that it's survival of the fittest, um, is that caused by only the strongest reproducing? Yes. Or the strongest e reproducing more than individuals that are not as strong. So Darwin concluded that the unequal ability of individuals to survive and to reproduce leads to gradual changes in the population as the traits which help the organism survive and reproduce accumulate over generations, Ruth, very important, generations. Okay, 
and those that inhibit its survival and reproduction are lost, and that survival of the fittest. And Darwin used the term natural selection to describe this process. So survival of the fittest is natural selection? Yes, and it's also the same thing as descent with modification. They're all exactly the same thing. One, natural selection is more the, the mechanism. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. I would say, um, like going back to the beetles that we did uh, in the beginning, where like some of them are disguised so they don't eat them. Is that also a survival? Camouflaged. Yeah, is that also a survival? Absolutely. But there, uh, so here we speak about survival of the in terms of reproduction. But survival of the fittest can also be in terms of who is. If some of them are not, not camouflaged and more likely to be eaten by predators, they're not going to reproduce. So it's, no, it's part of the same story. Just, just careful. So, so they no, don't Lombard keep that. Yeah. So they okay. the, the more camouflaged individuals are deemed the stronger individuals. Yes, the fitter. Okay. In that environment, they are the fitter. Okay. But if something happens to change that environment, for example, there's lots of rain, and therefore the environment becomes greener, then sorry for the brown beetles. Okay. Microevolution and macroevolution. So remember, we've spoken about the fact I'm just going back to what we did originally. Um, genetic variation that occurs at the species level. So it's within a species, it's not a whole new species. Adding alleles occurs by mutation, recombination, remember, meiosis, meiosis, crossing over, recombination, that adds certain alleles, and gene flow, we've spoken about that, and two ways in which alleles are removed from a population, natural selection and genetic drift. Okay. Macroevolution, one species evolves into a different species, and you've got to listen very carefully to this. This is important. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, when is it appropriate to use the word alleles? Because to like, if an organism is homozygous, would you say that the alleles are the, sa are the same, or would you say the genes are the same? OK, so the people differ in their opinion about when it is and isn't. In theory, if they <coughs> an organism is homozygous, then you could say the two alleles for that characteristic are the same. So it's not wrong. It's I don't know. No. Okay. So species, remember, is a group of organisms all sharing similar structure fe structural features, able to breed amongst themselves, not with any other species, and produce fertile offspring. Okay. Right. Focus. Listen hard. Speciation is a process within evolution that needs to, leads to the formation of new distinct species that are terribly important to <coughs> reproductively isolated from one another. Okay, so we're talking about how it reaches a new species. Okay, so just for interest's sake, don't obsess about this. Forest elephants in South Africa have long been considered a subspecies of the African elephant. So you know that an African elephant is Loxodonta africana. Genus name, species name. You need to be able to tell the difference between genus and species. And you learnt it in grade eight. So everybody always has a two-word scientific name. Okay, so humans, it's Homo sapiens. We, in fact, have a subspecies, so we're Homo sapiens sapiens. But African elephants are Loxodonta africana. This is the genus name, and this is the species name. Now, be careful. They will ask you to write the genus name or something of an African elephant, and if you write Loxodonta africana, you ignore it, because that's the whole name. And if you write Africana, you get naught because that's a species name. And you've got to write it with a capital letter, and you need to underline it. You see, when it's typed, it's typed in italics. You must underline it. 
hand underline. Don't go and get a ruler, just underline it by hand. Okay. Evidence is now available to show that the forest elephant and the African savanna elephant are two different species. They have got morphological studies. Morphology means structure. And genetic studies, you know what that means. They have shown that they're two distinct species. So the African savanna or bush elephants and the forest elephants. Both belong to the genus Loxodonta, but this is a uh, scientific name, Loxodonta cyclotus. They're much smaller. So this would be like, I think the Nisner elephants are considered forest elephants. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you can see the ears of the species. Yeah, the, yeah they, they're very, very different. Right. Um, I was going to say, would they struggle to find any nice the elephants you see? Yeah. yeah. But they have, over the last few years, actually spotted quite a, more than one. At one stage, they thought it was down to one that they couldn't even find, and now they've spotted more than so one. So they aren't they are extinct, they're still. Yes. But there are other areas in Africa, I think, that have got the forest elephants. Okay, anyway, speciation is the process of forming a new species. And it occurs in two different ways. You have to, have to, have to know it. So they will give you a scenario and they will say what type of speciation occurred here. And you've got to be able to say allopatric or sympatric and you've got to be able to justify it. Okay, so listen carefully. This one's really easy. So allopatric speciation is when individuals in a population become separated by a geographic barrier. So they're physically isolated from each other. And each group is busy doing mutations. So mutations are occurring, mutations are occurring, mutations are occurring. But because there's a geographic barrier separating them, they cannot breed with each other. And so the mutations here accumulate, and the mutations here accumulate, and remember that mutations are random changes. So the changes that are occurring here are different to the changes that are occurring here. And therefore, if they finally put back together again, they are now a different species if it has happened for long enough, and they cannot interbreed with each other. Right, does that make sense? Okay, let me give you some examples. So if the barrier breaks down, individuals of the two populations can no longer interbreed because they're too different from each other. So they are reproductively isolated from each other, and they're two different species. And I'm going to give you some examples. Examples of the Galapagos finches, the Galapagos tortoises, sometimes called geographic speciation. There it shows you. Here you've got population of beetles. They fit that definition of a population, which you know. And a geographic barrier occurs, like, for example, a river forms or a fold mountain occurs or something like that. Mutations are occurring, mutations are occurring. And this population has mutated to some of them having green coloration, and these ones have brown coloration, and if the two populations are put together again, they're reproductively isolated from each other. Might be as simple as something like they don't recognize each other's courtship procedures, or it might be that they've actually developed reproductive organs that don't fit together any longer. And this is definitely a case with certain of the insect populations. So there are lots of different species of damselfly, which is a bit like a dragonfly, where what has happened with speciation is that the end of the abdomens have changed shape in certain species. So individuals that used to be able to mate with each other because their reproductive organs fit together no longer are able to mate because their reproductive organs no longer fit together. Okay, and therefore they're actually unable to do sexual reproduction. 
so they are reproductively isolated from each other. These ones can reproduce, these ones can reproduce, put them together, cannot reproduce, reproductively isolated from each other. So here we've got, and this is very unscientific, because it calls a tortoise a turtle. Okay, so here we've got a little forest habitat, and there's rain, and they're little turtles, and they eat fallen fruit and they bob their head. So that's their behavior, and that's their food. And then what happens is a mountain range appears, and so this sign is forest, and this sign is grassland and forest, and it diversified the habitat, and what happened is over time, these um, turtles, mutated and these turtles mutated and when eventually what happened is these ones ate fallen fruit and bobbed their heads because this environment hadn't changed. It was still the same as it was. But this little turtle, there's no longer fallen fruit because there are no longer trees because now it's grassland and it eats grass and grunts. So if you put them together they're not going to recognize each other's behavior. They reproductively isolate from each other. Going? Um, you know, like you said, almost animals don't, don't you? can like make a living. Like, how come, like, can you do with plants? It's to do with um, meiosis. So, because the chromosomes which came from the horse are different from the chromosomes which came from the donkey, when the mule, um, either in the testes or in the ovaries, when spermatogenesis or oogenesis starts to occur, and meiosis one occurs, these chromosomes are not homologous to these. So that the homologs can't pair with each other and cross over and go to the, the on either side of the equator. So at that point, meiosis stops. So they can't make gametes. So like realistically, could like all moles die? Yes. Yes. They could be extinct. Absolutely. It wasn't for the fact that apparently mules are really good, um, really desirable in terms of animals who do work. Mm -hmm. They apparently really, really, they've got endurance and they can work very hard. Albeit that they very stubborn. Okay, so this is an excellent example of allopatric spe uh, speciation. So, you know, um, at the bottom of North America and South America, there's a land bridge called the Isthmus of Panama. You know this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, guys, you such sad little children. <laughs> Pardon? Don't rub your buttons. Hmm? Don't rub your buttons. No, 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 Okay. Um, so, okay. Can you guys see the board? America, there's Ecuador, there's Galactic Islands. Okay. This little piece of land is called the Isthmus of Panama. Okay. And one of the reasons is because the country of Panama is there. Um, and the Isthmus of Panama didn't always used to be there. That good English. Wasn't always there. Okay. There used to be no land here. And so the sea here and the sea here was continuous. And animals used to be able to swim from side to side, etc., etc. And then over a period of time, the Isthmus of Panama formed, which separated the sea here from the sea here. Now there's a funny little animal that lives in that area called a snapping shrimp. Okay. 
If you look at a snapping shrimp, here it is. And it's got one huge claw with which it actually snaps. So it, it makes a sound. Apparently it sounds like a pistol being shot. Okay. And that's, it's, that's why it's called a snapping shrimp. But that's irrelevant at the moment. Anyway, what happened was... This was a geographic barrier that separated what used to be one population of snapping shrimp into two separate populations of snapping shrimp. And what has happened is, over a very long period of time, mutations have happened here and mutations have happened here, and if these snapping shrimp, which actually look quite similar to each other, are put together, they refuse to mate with each other. They're a different species. They're reproductively isolated from each other. So that's just an example of allopatric speciation. Okay. So the Isthmus of Panama closed about three million years ago and created a land bridge between North and South America. You do know that there's a Panama Canal, hey? Yes, sir. Okay. So the Panama Canal is a man-made structure where um, people actually, just like the Suez Canal, people actually dug a canal from this ocean to that ocean, but it doesn't allow enough mixing of these organisms to try and reverse the thing. So it has been researched. Um, a scientist at the Smithsonian actually did research on it. The snapping shrimp on both sides appeared almost identical because they were once members of the same population, but when males and females from the different sides of the isthmus were put together, that's how you spell isthmus, they snapped aggressively instead of courting. They had become separate species, just as the theory of allopatric speciation has predicted they would. So did they fight, though? Like I think they just snapped aggressively. Oh, okay. Depends on whether you talk <laughs> physical fighting. So here's the Isthmus of Panama, between Colombia and Costa Rica. Okay. All right. So you have to understand allopatric speciation. That's a really, really easy concept to get. Okay. All right. Darwin's observation on his voyage of the Beagle support allopatric speciation. He saw lots of examples of it. So he found that most organisms found on the Galapagos Islands, and remember that Galapagos can be spelt with the accent graph on the, that second A, or sometimes it's spelt without it, and it's fine. You can do it either way, I don't mind. He found that most organisms found on the Galapagos Islands are endemic. This is a word you need to know. It means naturally found in one area only. So it's different from indigenous. So organisms that are endemic are indigenous, but organisms that are indigenous are not necessarily endemic. I've got a nod. Two nods. Only found in one area. Yes, in one particular area. Indigenous doesn't mean that they only in that area. Yes, that's correct. So they're found naturally in that area, but they can be found naturally in other areas as well. Okay, whereas endemic means they're found naturally in that area, so they're indigenous, but they're found only in that area. In that area only, sorry, I only was in the wrong place. But kangaroo. Yeah, indigenous and endemic. Now, you know the, the papa? Yes. So, was that a combination between a... No. No, it was, it was an entire species of the mm. soul. Okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Everybody happy? All right. So why are most of the organisms found in the Galapagos Islands endemic or only found there? Because of the separation of populations by the barriers the bodies of water between the different islands. This was in the question in the trick exam last year, paper two, it was really badly answered. Um, so this is the normal prickly pear cactus. 
So if this represents ground, normal prickly pear cactus is about that high. Okay, and it's got these big, big flattened, these are not leaves, these are actually stems. Um, it's got these big flattened, you can call them leaves, I'm okay. Um, but they're actually not. The thorns are the modified leaves. And they on the they attach directly to the ground and then the fruit, the prickly pear that you guys eat, forms around the outside like that of the flattened um, stem structure. But the prickly pear cactus in on Galapagos Islands, especially the very dry Galapagos Islands, have got these very tall stem-like structures and then those are modified stems with the fruit produced around the edge of the little modified stems here. So this is very different from that one. These two are incredibly different. Yep. Okay. All right. So Darwin's finches, and remember that this is an example of divergent evolution, not convergent, like a dolphin and a shark, divergent evolution. Um, or adaptive radiation. So remember that the finches were separated from the mainland and other islands. So on each island, different species of finches have evolved with different kinds of beaks suited to different diets, and therefore they were able to survive on the different on the different islands. So this is a cactus finch. Okay. This is a, this one eats seeds because it's got a very, when I say thick beak, I mean from top to bottom. Thick beak as opposed to a, a narrow pointy beak. So this one is insectivorous, this one eats seeds it needs that very thick beak to crack open seeds and get to the seed the nutritious matter on the inside of the seed but this one probes in other words it uses that long pointy beak to probe in little crevices so for example in the stem structure here see the little holes there then what those ones do is they probe in there. And one of them, to the extent of, and it's absolutely amazing, it picks off little thorns off the cactus. So it picks these little thorns off. And it uses that almost like a sort of toothpicky thing. You know when you go to a cocktail party and you use a toothpick to stab, 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 what do you eat at a cocktail party? Muscles. Stab the muscles and then eat them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ribs. No. How do you stab ribs with a toothpick? Is it ribs? Oh, grapes. Yes, no. good one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not just saying no. ribs. No. Okay. Mm. Before you carry on, um, I'm just a little bit confused. Can you go to where it's the prickly pears again? Is you know, the slide? Um, so the one on the right, you said that's one on the dry islands. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, yes. But I thought it was the, the cactus looking one that was one on the dry islands. No, this is from North America. Shrub like. So on the dry islands, it's these ones. Mm -hmm. And on the wet islands, it's not these ones. It's normal typical trees. Mm -hmm. Typical trees. Well, so that not pretty fair trees. Oh, okay. Okay, no, no. So there won't be any pretty pear cactuses on the islands that get good rainfall. Okay. okay, I can see how you could confuse that. That's not what I meant. No. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Um, did you say that the other type of pretty pear was what we have? Yes. Because every time, all the pretty pears that I've seen are little trees. So mm. not like little in the grass. Where are you looking at fucking pigs? No, they're not in the fish. Not tree.